Uh, so welcome everyone. So we're thrilled that you could join us today for our first webinar focused on community wealth building powered by RBC. Today, we're gonna hear about how community wealth is driven from an intentional use of principles grounded from local resources and how we can play a role within our respective organizations to create an inclusive and equitable economy so that everyone can thrive. My name is Shannon Bruce, and I'm the Senior Director of Community Initiatives here at United Way East Ontario, and I'm pleased to be the MC for today's event. So again, please do note that we do have subtitles turned on for, uh, for our Zoom event today. You can choose to turn them on for yourself by selecting CC and show subtitles in your Zoom options. So again, if you want to leverage that closed captioning. It's with profound respect that we acknowledge the privilege to be operating and performing on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. We recognize the Indigenous people of Turtle Island who have been thriving on this land for centuries. We also recognize Canada's history of colonization and the ongoing violence against Indigenous peoples and their culture. As guests on this land, we promise to walk gently and with respect. So let's get started on, on today's event. While I have the opportunity, I want to run through some Zoom reminders so we're all comfortable and get the most out of the platform. So again, you can use the chat box function at any point to get our team's attention and help should you need it. So again, I have a few of my colleagues from United Way ready to give you a hand. So again, please ensure that you're on mute during the event. Um, and again, given the size of our event today, we'll encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions or comment. But if you need to, you can always raise your hand uh, in, your, in your Zoom functions as well, and we can watch for that. For you tweeters out there, our hashtag for today is hashtag building community wealth. So I encourage that if you hear a great idea or something that comes to mind for yourself, let's share it on social media and get others thinking about it as well. And we also know that with these types of events and being on camera for a lengthy period of time, it can sometimes be challenging and exhausting. So please feel free to have your camera on or off as, uh, as works best for you. But when we do our breakout session, we do encourage that you have your camera on to interact with others in the group. So we will be taking some photos throughout today's event so we can share it afterwards. And today's event you've noticed is being recorded and we'll look to share the recording after the event for those who want to revisit the content or potentially share it with their teams. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. So you would have received uh, the agenda as well as speaker biographies prior to the event, but we'll also add it to the chat box now along with a helpful document of key terms. Very quickly regarding the agenda, so we're going to do a quick icebreaker to get us started, followed by an overview of community wealth building, knowing that some of you are very familiar with these conversations and some may be newer. We'll then welcome David Lepage from Buy Social Canada to highlight the opportunities to create impact through how we buy and sell. Next, I'll have the pleasure of speaking to a local business owner in Lanark County, Ian Carswell from the Black Tartan Kitchen who will tell us about the commitment to community and how it translates into buying local for his business. Andrea Pierce will then highlight the opportunities to build capacity and access for those who often do not get to reap the success in the current procurement processes. We'll then bring our minds together to think about how we can build bridges to opportunities she's identified. Before we go further, I also wanna say thank you to our sponsor, RBC. They've been a major partner for United Way East Ontario in a number of initiatives, including those focused on community wealth building, and we sincerely thank them for their ongoing support. Okay, are we ready? So today we're going to be focusing on social procurement and social purchasing. And although we're not all leaders, leaders by titles in our organizations, we can still be leaders in our actions. So I really want to bring this down to an individual impact level as we get started. I know in my own journey to support local or non-traditional business models, part of the challenge can be awareness as to what's out there. So here's what I want you to do. So if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to think about a great product or experience that you've had lately with a local vendor, business, or service provider in your community. Okay, so just think about that, you know, and something that made you feel good or a great product you bought home you were really excited about, maybe a new discovery. Now, if you close your eyes, open your eyes. And what I'd like you to do is uh, take a moment to open the chat. And I don't want you to hit send right away, but I want you to type in the name of that business that you that came to mind for you. 
So take a moment and think about that business for you. Write in the chat. And when I say go, I'm gonna ha I'm gonna ask you all to hit send at the same moment. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to write in that business that came to mind for you. Great. So now everybody hit send, and if you're still typing, that's okay. Look at this. I have I, I have my two screens going, and I have the the chat box coming in over on the uh, on my other screen. So you'll see me look over there every once in a while. I love it. Some of those names I'm familiar with, and definitely some uh, some new ones for me. And I hope there's some new ones there for you as well. So thanks for taking a moment to share that. You know, I think a it helps us think about you know where are some places that we love locally. But also, now we each have our own little East Ontario, or maybe a little bit further if you're from outside of our communities here, directory of, of great places to try out. Um, and again, if you want to save these names, what you can do, and you may want to do this a little later as well, in the chat function on Zoom, there are three little dots. And if you click on those, uh, you can select Save Chat. And that will automatically uh, save onto, onto your device. And so again, a great way to capture any of these public chats that are there and throughout the session as we share links and those types of pieces. So some great information to be able to gather there. Thank you for doing that. So let's build some foundation around our conversations today. So what is community wealth building? It's a people-centered approach to local economic development that aims to reorganize local economies so that wealth isn't extracted but rather redirected back into communities. It's also partly focused on the economic power of local institutions to support local areas and their communities. So you'll hear these commonly referred to as anchor institutions. So think about these large locally rooted organizations such as councils, hospitals, universities, colleges, housing associations, those types of things. How do they spend their money, employ people, use their land, property or financial assets can make a huge impact in the local area, right? So all these things that you see listed here are ways that they can, they can drive some change. So as an example, with finance, increased flows of investment within local economies by harnessing and recirculating the wealth that exists as opposed to attracting capital. Around land and property, deepen the function and ownership of local assets held by anchor institutions so that the financial and social gain is harnessed by the citizens. And as an example, a generative economy, develop and grow small locally owned enterprises, which are more financially generative for the local economy. So really locking wealth into place. In today's conversation around community wealth building, we're focusing on social procurement and social purchasing. But what do these mean, right? So again, let's build that foundation. Social procurement means buying goods and services from social enterprises or businesses run by marginalized groups in order to create positive impact through purchasing. So you can have written policies in place to support these activities. And it's important to note that government and institutional policies are really crucial in driving this change and making it happen. So a few examples that come to mind here is maybe a company wants to procure shirts for Orange Shirt Day, go to a, a, find a local indigenous vendor as an example. A company needs landscaping services. Uh, here in Ottawa, we have a few great examples of social enterprises who offer these types of services. And a restaurant needs produce for its menu. Well, how do you look and source locally and from uh, organizations that may not be those that you've typically accessed? As we look at social, social purchasing, so that idea of buy and shop local, Social purchasing is a concerted effort to encourage customers to modify their spending habits and select local goods, local services and products, potentially even from social enterprises. So a few examples that we've heard around our, uh, our conversations were purchasing thank you cookies from a social enterprise here locally, sourcing holiday gift baskets uh, from a women owned business, as well as having journals added in that we purchased from an indigenous owned business. When we're doing team lunches, we look to our social enterprise or small local small businesses in the community and investment choices. And I, I wanted to add this one here because I heard a great example lately that challenged me to think a little bit differently. And to be as a former banker, I was kind of intrigued on this one. So an organization had assets to invest as part of their holdings. And rather than investing through traditional investment vehicles like bonds or equity funds, they were informed about a different type of investment available through a boutique Canadian investment company that offered a financial return and a social return. So not only does the fund provide traditional returns, 
but it also adds impact value in the community through the support of social housing. So just how do we think differently about what we're, how we're approaching this? So now that we've set a bit of the foundation, we wanna hear from our guests about why this is important and what can it look like in action? So first, I wanna take the opportunity to introduce you to David Lepage. And some of you may be familiar with David. Uh, he is the founder and managing partner of Bisocial Canada and founding partner in Canada's social enterprise ecosystem project. He promotes social procurement in Canada and is an experienced longstanding advocate on behalf of the role of social enterprise in strong local and national economies. He's the author of the book, Marketplace Revolution, From Concentrated Wealth to Community Capital. And he's a wealth of knowledge in this area. So David, we're so pleased to have you here today. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Shannon. And it's really always an honor to, to work with different communities um, because we get an opportunity to share some of the stories that are happening, but also it's so encouraging because things are progressing so much. And when we think about the conversations that we've had over the years, we start to realize the importance of some of the points that Shannon brought up. So if we can go, we start to think about every purchase actually has an impact. Um, it has an economic and environmental impact, whether in general or not. And, Historically, purchasing has really been about an economic transaction. And what we're talking about today, when we talk about social procurement and social purchasing, we're really talking about moving from a financial transaction to using procurement as a tool to build healthy communities. So wealth building can happen when we look at buying and selling with impact intentionally. So the next slide. When we think about it, we're still going to need to buy things, whether it's institutions or government or corporations or individuals. We're still going to have suppliers we work with. But what we're talking about is continuing the marketplace, but moving from just an economic marketplace to a social value marketplace. We're talking about using our purchasing, adding a social value, and then that creates community value. And when we think about community value, we think about it in the next slide as community capital. And community capital is made up of physical capital. That's the built and the, and the natural environment. There is continuation of economic capital. There's cultural capital, the recognition of the diversity, the inclusion of indigenous communities. There's human capital. We talk about creating training and apprenticeships and, and jobs for everybody who wants to participate. But also really, really important is social capital. Social capital is created through the relationships that we create with family, with friends, with colleagues, with neighbors. And that's what builds resilient and healthy communities when we bring all these capitals together. And why should we bother? Uh, the next slide, I think, can give us some idea of just some of the economic impact that happens um, when you think about buying with impact. When you think about the fact that if we spend $100 with a local business, $63 stays in the community. So that means that that business is getting that purchase, but that purchase is hiring people locally. Those people are paying rent the owner is paying rent or paying taxes. So 63% stays in the community, 63% out of every dollar spent when we buy local instead of multinational. When we think about buying from a social enterprise, as Shannon mentioned, and then the potential social return on investment is something like $4 for every dollar we spend. Because what happens is we're moving people out of poverty. We're moving people into their own housing, their own self-esteem. They're, they're not needing the health services and, and the other services because they're now contributing back to the community. And that's what they want to do. And this is a way to provide those opportunities. So when we think about that, the next slide starts to tell us about what are some options. And, and I think Shannon mentioned a number of these, like when we purchase, can we think about a social enterprise? 
in the next slide, can we think about local? Can we think about a women-owned business or diverse-owned business? We refer to that as the concentric circle consideration because it's where we buy can really define the impact that we're going to have in a community. So if we think about not only who we buy from, but where is their supply chain? So sometimes we need to buy a big project or an institution needs to do a food vendor, but can that food vendor be asked to buy locally? Is that food vendor looking at employment practices that include diversity? So it really is an opportunity for us to look at what are the impacts in the next slide. And when we think about what can happen <clears throat> when we do that supplier choices, we start to create opportunities for employment for underrepresented and, and equity deserving groups. We start to actually include suppliers that have been excluded from the economic uh, marketplace because we're talking about small businesses, we're talking about diverse owned businesses. And then we start to look at, are we actually also creating opportunities for training and apprenticeships? And all of those things happen when we want to buy with impact. And then the other piece we start to look at is that builds community, right? So the next slide, when we think about what are some of those impacts? It's just fascinating because when we look at some of the social enterprises, like in the Ottawa region and, and Eastern Ontario, you think of like <clears throat> Crackers Catering and they've been around for maybe 20 years now. The number of people who have been given an advantage, have been employed, given an opportunity to, to be part of a community because government institutions and private sector and families have chosen Crackers Catering to do their their parties or do their lunches. We think of eco equitable, working with immigrant women to give them an opportunity to grow and to be engaged in the next slide, please. And we think about all the different opportunities. We think about in Toronto, you know, groups like building up, working with young people to get into construction. Eva's print shop, working with youth to get ready for jobs. So really all the opportunities that can be created. And I know we talk sometimes about it's small companies, but it's also big companies. When we think about you know, health insurance, Green Shield Canada is a health insurance company that is a social enterprise. They were created 60 years ago because some factory workers needed access to health insurance. Now they're a billion dollar a year social enterprise, their profits go back into the community through their foundation. So there's really lots of opportunities to look at what we spend, how we spend it, and the impact that it can have in the next slide. And the last thing, just if any of you are interested, Buy Social Canada is part of trying to build this whole ecosystem around social procurement. So in our website, um, all kinds of resources that we make available, we provide courses, et cetera. So glad to answer any questions later on when we have time, but now I'm gonna turn it back to Shannon. Wonderful, thank you so much, David, that was amazing. You've provided us with a lot of great insights and again, that foundation to continue to build on. Uh, one of the pieces that really stuck out for me was I love the idea of using our purchasing to add social value. So just that 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 piece, but I think it's really that question that we can ask ourselves. And I can, I know I'm going to try to do it more actively for myself if I'm buying a gift or doing an event. But is there a way to approach my choices differently to add social value? And what are they? And you've shared some great examples there, um, both local ones that we can access now. And I also appreciate the aspirational ones that you shared in other communities that we can look towards as examples. So thank you again for that. I encourage folks to check out the tools and resources on the Buy Social Canada website, uh, which again, I saw was added in the chat. So thank you for that. So now I wanna welcome uh, Ian Carswell. 
He's the chef and owner of Black Tartan Kitchen. Ian has roots in the Ottawa Valley, and in 2016, he opened the Black Tartan Kitchen in Carleton Place. Uh, some of you maybe are familiar and have visited there in the past, and if not, I can assure you it's somewhere that you definitely want to go. Uh, he and his team are known for giving back to the community, but also support it through business practices. The Black Tartan Kitchen showcases the seasonal bounty that Lanark County and the Ottawa Valley have to offer, and they work with local suppliers to source ingredients and showcase them where possible. It's a great example of building a business community in mind. So you'll see uh, in the chat, we'll share the link to, uh, to Black Tartan Kitchen, as well as a great local story about uh, some initiatives that they've had in place during COVID. Uh, so welcome, Ian. Hi, thanks a lot for having me. Great, thanks for being here today. <laughs> I am gonna pop this over here. So, you know, really, again, really excited to have you here today. So your, your restaurant's in Lanark County, and you work with a lot of uh, producers across the valley, though. Uh, and I'm curious, did you always have a plan to focus on local producers when you were building Black Tartan? Um, when we, uh, yeah, I, short answer is yes. Um, we, <laughs> yeah, when we were starting uh, to kind of decide where we wanted to open up a restaurant, um, you know, that was a big reason why we chose Carleton Place as well, is because um just there were such uh, it was like the close proximity to all the farmers and uh you know that's how it kind of started um out here so it uh it was kind of one of the pillars we wanted to to build the business on was to to support support locally and kind of get that farm to table as fresh as possible so yeah and how how has it evolved over time as you as you've grown your business so i think if anything it's just it's kind of it's been more than what we could have ever hoped for in terms of um, connections to local farmers, because, you know, it started with like the idea of, okay, we're going to be close to all the farms, which is going to be great. And, you know, we can go to all the farmers markets and, um, but it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of grown to more than just that. I mean, like, you know, we have two local breweries in town here. So, you know, we, uh, we only stock their beer. Um, you know, we were able to kind of make, uh, there's a local cider producer at an arm prior. Um, but I mean, just all the artisans along the way, uh, people who are making cheese, people who are making wine, uh, just outside of, uh, Ottawa and Carp. So, um, it's, it, it's, it's really just kind of, um, yeah, it's just really exploded in terms of like, the potential for uh, you you know uh, shopping locally in terms of the, the the produce and the beverage and stuff, but you know goods and services is like come hand in hand as well too. So there's a whole bunch of other businesses that you know uh, a great resource for here too. So yeah, no, oh, excellent. And I and I'm just to kind of build off of that a little bit. I'm curious, what mm -hmm. do you what do you notice is the impact as a business when you're uh, when you're choosing to to buy locally? How does that impact your local relationships or you know just the community in general through regenerating? You know, you're putting that income back into there. Do you notice anything in particular or? Yeah, like well, and that's exactly it. I mean, you're basically um, you're adding to the you know community that's been supporting you. So I mean, people see that, and um, people have been making a really big push these days to to be supporting uh, local more often and wherever possible. Um, so it's it's good to see uh, that kind of relationship. Like I mean, it, it's not just as well too about um, about where the money's going. I mean, also like for example, we deal with uh, one of the local farms here. Um, they pick up our organic waste as well too and uh, feed it to the pigs you know or use it for compost so i mean um there's so many kind of different avenues i guess you can take with the relationships here and um but i mean you know that's saving him on you know whatever feed he would have had to, to to use or purchase to uh uh to feed those animals but um but yeah i mean like it's uh, yeah it's there's lots of opportunity out here for sure so. no that's that's amazing mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that and yeah. I'm, I'm curious about uh you know, on the side of the, the challenges. So, you know, with your commitment to source locally, how, mm -hmm. how do you pivot when needed? You know, like the example that comes to mind is what if an ingredient you want isn't available or, or that type of thing? How, how do you work around that? Or what are some yeah. of the pieces that happen? Yeah, and I mean, that's a great question because that was one of my big, um, kind of like it was one of my questions when we started this was, you know, it's, it's not like you can, you know, say, okay, uh, I want to just have lamb rack on my menu coming from Melkos Farms because, you know, they may only be harvesting two or three animals at a, a, you know, a month or every two months. And so it just doesn't, it can't keep up to the demand of, you know, everybody coming in every night wanting a lot rack of lamb. Like you have to, it challenges you as a chef as well, too, because you want to be able to use the rest of the animal. Um, so, I mean, you'd be purchasing a whole animal versus, um, you know, just one specific cut. 
Um, or, you know, also using uh, their other products like they make cheese as well too. So we can incorporate that into the menu. Um, so really it's kind of, it's really changed the way that we write the menus here, I think, um, which is kind of funny, um, like to, to kind of go to take that kind of hard turn, I guess. But, um, but yeah, so instead of, like I said, instead of a piece, like, I mean, we might just be using it in a dish um, and uh, just to kind of, it also helps the farmer, um, you know, utilize the entire animal as opposed to just selling one cut over and over again, and then having to turn the rest of the animal into grind or something, um, you know, which isn't ideal, but, um, but yeah, so, you, you know, if, if you can't find what ingredient you need, I mean, you just kind of broaden your horizon as to like, what could, what else could you use? Like, I mean, or, you know, a vegetable that might not be in season. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, using local produce in the middle of January, middle of February, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and by the time the end of March rolls around, everybody's tired of root vegetables, but, um, you know, you just, you change and adapt, you write your menus based on what's available and, uh, you know, if, okay, great. We don't have Swiss chard this week. We're going to use beet greens instead. Um, but, uh, you know, and once again, challenging as a chef to be able to, to cook whatever's available. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. You know, I know for myself, I'm kind of seeing that ecosystem come together, right? On mm -hmm. so, so many levels, you see that the social impact, that economic piece, the environmental piece, right? All of these uh, things coordinate and, uh, and drive mm -hmm. together. Um, and I'll just, I, I just do want to touch on, I know one of the, the links that, uh, that was shared just focuses on a recent um uh, way that you gave back to the community through your BOGO soup event, right? Your buy, your yeah. buy one, get one. Um, I think yep. we have a bit of time. Would you mind highlighting that and just the impact that had on the community? Yeah, of course. Um, like that was, yeah, that was a, that was my wife's idea. Uh, she, uh, Tessa's pretty great with those kind of uh, promotions and stuff. But I mean, we've, we've been kind of working hand in hand with the food bank as well too, um, because it's such like a, a great relationship that we can have because they're right around the corner from us. Um, we can assist them with the uh, kind of production of goods and stuff that they can give out to their clients, um, as opposed to just giving, you know, um, you know, a couple bunches of Swiss chard to the client and the client's like, what do we do with it? So, you know, we can add that to a chili or a soup or something and, you know, giving the cut, the, the customer, the uh, food bank, just the leader of that is easier to, to heat up and consume. Um, so, you know, we've, we've done some things like that in the past. And, uh, so we figured, um, you know, we were closed obviously with all the COVID restrictions. Um, so it gave us an opportunity to kind of give back to the community, keep me busy. Um, you know, and Tessa's eyes, it got me out of the house back to work for a bit. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, I think, I think it's just, you know, it, one of those things that kind of came naturally of like, you know, let's do something, let's do something that can kind of help out people that are in need right now. And, uh, you know, that's another thing like the community here in Carlton Place was fantastic. Like people were lined up around the block in the middle of it was like minus 22 and like consistently. So to kind of get that kind of support from your community, I mean, like that just kind of shows you that, you know, whatever decisions you are making, it's, it's working in that sense, too. So uh, it was just uh, almost overwhelming to, to, to see that much community support coming in. Yeah, no, that's amazing. And I know, I know here in Ottawa, I remember hearing on the radio another uh, local restaurant or two who were influenced by that and then say, hey, how do we do something, you know, and again, yeah. it's it, again, sharing those ideas out in the open can really drive yeah. that change. So, so thank you for that and, and sharing that. And uh, for those, if you go check out on the, the website, there's a couple of great photos too of uh, not only did it get Ian out of the house, but it got your kids yeah. out of the house too, right? So yep. <laughs> helping, Absolutely. helping with some of that. So love yeah. it. That was great too. Um, I mean, showing the kids, you know, how to, yeah. how to get back as well too. And they were all behind it. So, yeah. 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 And again, the, the photos of the, the folks in line, right. They appreciate how much you do give back in the community and give back through, through that as well. So, so thank you for elaborating on, on that example a little bit more. Um, I'm curious, you know, in, in the work we're doing around community wealth building and, and we're building this up, part of it is about helping, helping others understand what, uh, what they can be doing. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, as we work to encourage to equip other businesses in East Ontario to support and source local, what advice do you have, or maybe what are some challenges that that came up, you know, where you're like, no, you might hit the same challenge here. So we yeah. got through it. So yeah, do you want to share some ideas? No, absolutely. I mean, um, I think one of the biggest things, uh, like, especially if you're, I mean, whether you're a new business or not, is uh, the local chamber of commerce has been a fantastic uh, resource in terms of um, as soon as you know you join the join the chamber of commerce, get into a couple of the networking events, and I mean it's just like an immediate rolodex of everybody local and every service and every restaurant or every 
um, you know, producer. I mean, a lot of farms can kind of get in on it as well, too, uh, from my perspective. But um, just being open to uh, to making new contacts and, uh, you know, going out and talking to people. Um, you know, for myself, it's, you know, we go to the farmer's market and or we'll go to another farmer's market. And like the farmers around here, everybody's been like so keen to help and encourage other farmers, too. So, I mean, like I'll be there talking to, you know, to Peter or something. And he's like, oh, you have to meet so and so. And so we'll just go over to the next farm stand and, you know, kind of run over the introductions. So uh, word of mouth has always been great. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Chamber of Commerce has uh, been a great resource. And I mean, completely honest, like if there's a service that you're looking for, I mean, even just typing like in Google, a Google search, just, you know, the product you're looking for and the town you're looking for it in. Um, that's also worked in the past as well, too. I mean, you know, um, social media is a big one. Um, yeah, just basically, uh, I guess, in terms of advice, uh, just keep your uh, keep possibilities open and, uh, and get out there and network as best you can. No, thank you for that. You know what I think? I love too that you have some more coordinated uh, examples in there, you know, that relationship building and some of it is just simply, hey, we've got assets at our fingertips. How do we, yeah. how do we leverage that and and not make, uh, so to speak, not to make a mountain out of a molehill, right? Just start, start exactly. doing it. But, so thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, you're welcome. And I, yeah. And again, Ian, I appreciate so much you coming and sharing uh, part of your experience and your insights that you have with us. Um, and also for all that you and your team and your family do for the community, you know, it, uh, you, you show some great leadership and we appreciate you taking the time to come and share some of that with us. Um, and I have had the chance to experience the, the food at the Black Tartan. I highly, highly recommend it. So please uh, take a drive out to Carlton Place and probably best to reserve your spot though, right? So uh, yep. definitely go check it out and taste some of that local flavor that, uh, that they serve up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Excellent. No, thank you very much for uh, including me and let me be a part of the conversation. Great. So now that we've heard from uh, from David about the impact and ripple effects our choices can have, as well as key things to think about uh, as we get started. Ian then has also shared his local example of supporting the community through business practices. Um, now I have the pleasure of introducing you to Andrea Pierce. Who will talk about building capacity and access to the supply side of resourcing. So Andrea Pierce is the founder of Immigrants Can and Black Entrepreneurship Hub. She's a leader of the collective impact approach to advancing the objectives of and advocating for the adoption of special measures to combat anti-Black racism in Canada, as per the goals outlined in the UN International Decade of People of African Descent. Her focus has been on community wealth building, and in this, she has advocated and supported uh, development of federal procurement strategy for Black-owned businesses that piloted in February 2021. Um, I also just want to highlight, I have had the chance to meet Andrea a few times recently as, I, as I've come into this work around community wealth building, um, and she is a, a very engaging speaker, and I really look forward to, to hearing you today, and I encourage you to take a listen because after she's done, we'll move into an activity uh, based on some of what you hear from her and the other learnings we've had today. So over to you, Andrea. Welcome, and thank you. Oh, you're on mute still. now for being on mute. You're well, good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for um, inviting me. I really appreciate it. To, for, this is such an important conversation for us all to have um, together. So um, I want to say good afternoon. And I want to, to thank, again, the United Way. I, I, this has been so great so far. I love everything that David and Ian had spoken to. And I want to talk to you about three things today. Why the current system doesn't work, laying the foundation and setting the prerequisites for social procurement for marginalized groups, and five key requirements for success. So let's set the context first. You heard the things that David said. He's spot on. I've read a lot of the resources from Bisocial Canada. They definitely are spot on with what needs to be done in, in, in this area. Um, I think everyone here recognizes that social procurement is a powerful tool for promoting socioeconomic objectives. I've been advocating for the expansion of procurements to include Black businesses for years. Um, and we know there's billions of dollars 
in procurement, especially public procurements. So what is procurement like for businesses, right? It's an infusion of capital that comes from delivering value commercial from commercial activities. It's not a loan or a gift or a grant. It's people working for, for, for the, the money they get. You know, this is really important now when a lot of small business don't qualify for loans. As a result of the revenue declines that, that happened during COVID um, and the, the business closures. So if we look at our income for the last two years since COVID started, it's not what it was before. We're still in recovery. And so they don't look good to a bank. This is especially acute for Black, Aboriginal, and women-owned business, among others, groups who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And we won't talk about Black or Aboriginal-owned businesses who face a double penalty. So, you know, I was recently one of several small business on a project led by a certified Aboriginal business, LDC Solutions. This project was of course extremely successful from the economic point of view, but I want to talk about the other benefits that came from that project because it was led by an Aboriginal prime, LDC Solutions. This project had over 85% Aboriginal participation from all over Canada. Many of these businesses would never otherwise get a chance to even know about this opportunity or to win um, a con this contract on their own at all, if not for this Aboriginal business leading this project who had strong ties to, their, to his community. This is access to information and to networks that most marginalized groups, whether you're Black, Aboriginal, women-owned, you know, LGBT-owned, all those, small business lack right now. We had, in this project, we had great participation of Aboriginal women, and of course, myself as a Black woman-owned business. We socialized on Zoom and got to know about each other and each other's businesses. And now, other business opportunities have resulted from those in, those relationships we built while working together. LDC Solutions was intentional in the inclusion and development of youth. So I got a chance to work with some brilliant young people in the uh, First Nations community. And they had the opportunity to contribute, have meaningful work experience and build their networks. And of course, get paid well. This is especially important now, given the disproportionate effect that COVID-19 had on racialized people, especially women and youth. The December 2021 labor force survey reported, and I quote, youth unemployment was 10.5% below pre-pandemic levels. However, the youth unemployment rate reveals disproportionate impact for racialized communities. With unemployment rates were 20.9%, for Aboriginal youth and 30.1 for Black youth, meaning one in five Aboriginal youth was unemployed and one in three Black youth is unemployed right now. So with the example of this project, you know, when we talk about multiple banks for your buck, this is the multiplier effect that can be achieved through social procurement that David spoke about earlier. You've heard Ian already talk about the positive impact of local on local farmers and everyone in his supply chain, not to mention the delicious food that his customers get, right? And the, the, and the positive effect on the environment that he's getting his vegetables locally and it's not being shipped from Florida, California, or Mexico. This is just a microcosm of what is possible for all marginalized groups including but not limited to group excluded due to race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, physical ability, language, and or immigration status and their intersectionalities. 
So I'll go into my second area. Why doesn't this current system work? I'm gonna to talk, to, talk to three key areas. One is lack of access to information. Two, lack of access to social networks. And people spoke about ecosystems here. We'll talk a bit more about that. And third, lack of access to financial capital. So I talked about the LDC solutions contract. Most of those subcontractors would not have gotten the information to participate otherwise. Many studies have also cited the lack of information about like corporate buying, knowing the right person to talk to, having relationships that leads to business introduction and, and opportunities are not usually available to marginalized business owners. This leads into the social capital, the networks you have available. And Ian spoke to the local chamber of commerce, all those other areas. Marginalized business owners tend to have difficulty establishing robust business networks and connections with individuals and organizations that can actually generate business. Access to financial capital when it is lacking and when it's available, the terms are less favorable for marginalized business owners. Just to give you an example, for black businesses, the numbers are less than 1% of loan and investment goes to black owned businesses. And our recent report cited that 0.34% goes even less than half of that goes to black women owned business. The ecosystem should be more intentional of black women entrepreneurs, including the black entrepreneurship plan and the women entrepreneurship strategy. And I hope the social finance uh, and innovation fund. So what are the prerequisites and the foundational things that's required to make this really work? You know, so let me use the example of black owned businesses. Most black owned businesses, and I think it's the same, for women-owned businesses and many marginalized groups. So Black-owned business due to systemic anti-Black racism and the barriers we spoke about earlier, lack of access, um, start businesses in areas with low cost of entry and low barriers to entry. The challenges, the growth opportunities are also low for the most part in these areas. And they're usually consumer related, retail, professional services, et cetera. Black, owned, black business owners generally start a business rather than buy businesses due to the lack of access to capital, which add further limitations. And these are some of the reasons why COVID-19 had such a disproportionate impact on black and women owned businesses. So what does that mean? There is the need to be more intentional about the procurement process if you want to be inclusive. You can't build it and hope they will come when you haven't invited them to the table. And when they show up, you don't ask them to dance. Procurement experts must understand the current capacity of the groups they're targeting and help to build capacity in other areas where they're underrepresented. So they must look at the contracts, add scoring criteria that incentivize primes to include marginalized subcontractors and, or in some cases, break up those big contracts into smaller ones. The second prerequisite, I think that's important, is understanding the population you're targeting, where they are, where they're situated. In Ontario, over 50% of the Black population, Black population resides, for example. So we have GTA, Hamilton, Oshawa, Ottawa, and Windsor. And then in Quebec was next, Gatineau, Montreal, then Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton, Manitoba, Winnipeg, and Nova Scotia, Halifax. We're a largely urban population. And Ottawa, Gatineau is the third largest Black population in Canada. This means that if you have contracts up north, you're obviously not expecting a lot of Black business to participate based on the capacity of Black businesses and where we're located. Not to say that we can't participate and ship up north, but that would make the bid uncompetitive or we'll have to take a loss to win that contract, which is not why anyone does business. 
except if you're doing it to establish your, your record in a particular area. Lastly, I wanna talk about the five capacity building keys to success. The first one is removing systemic and artificial barriers and putting the prerequisite in place that was mentioned earlier. Second, build big readiness and tender capacity for marginalized businesses and the organizations doing procurements. Educate those corporations and governments on how to source from diverse business owners and business owners on how to win and do bids, uh, contract, do contracts and win bids. We need to identify diverse business owners, assess their readiness to access procurement opportunities, and certify them to do business with governments and corporations committed to supplier diversity and inclusion. One tip from me, if you wanna succeed, leverage those community organizations and businesses already doing that work and support it financially. Second, there, the system cannot keep using communities as free recruiters and service providers. They're already helping, which is why they're being contacted. So let's not add more burden of unpaid work. Support the work. Build business ecosystems by breaking down the barriers that prevent those business owners from connecting to each other and to, to market opportunities, including connections to local and multinational corporate buyers. Be intentional on the award criteria. Incentivize primes to subcontract with marginalized groups when you can't break up those contracts having shorter payment periods. Lots of small business can't wait the long time, for example, the federal government takes to pay. And lastly, being accountable for action, reporting on the metrics and the progress that is happening um, with respect to your social procurements. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea. We, you know, we know that many groups, including, including those you have mentioned, were exponentially negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, right, and that fallout and, and all of these pieces that come from it. And we have an opportunity to build back better with the strategies that support an equitable economic recovery. And the concepts of community wealth building are going to be so important for this, as well as understanding how to bridge the gaps that exist, so many of which you mentioned today. So, Again, thank you for sharing your insights and deepening our understanding of the opportunities that, that lie before us, right? And, and again, those, those pieces that you talked about, I know we have the five keys that we'll, we'll dig back into a little bit, but, but that idea of the lack of access to information, social capital, financial capital, right? It's kind of these puzzle pieces are, are sitting out there and it's to, you know, part of our, our role or opportunity that we have is to say, how do we um, build that access to each of those pieces? And I also appreciate where you, you've talked about understanding where are those communities or individuals at and what's stopping them, you know, and, and sometimes there can be that assumption that it's a lack of desire when actually it's the lack of knowledge or awareness of how on, on those pieces. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that. And we are going to, um, to dig a little bit deeper into those five keys to capacity building that you brought up. Um, and uh, but I did notice that we had a, a question come through in the chat, um, which I, I think will probably uh, be directed towards uh, towards Andrea or David, most likely. Um, and so it's from Janice Anderson uh, that we have here. So Janice mentions, I'm interested in hearing some thoughts about how social procurement can help to generate some opportunities for minorities and a lot of youth who are working in the gig economy. So she shares the examples of Uber, DoorDash, Amazon delivery services, et cetera. Um, so I'll open it if, if either of you have some thoughts to share on that. We have a couple of minutes. So I think there might be a question behind that question from me, which is, are they choosing this job because they want it? Or are they forced into that position because the economy is not supporting them to begin with? So if they're not getting paid a living wage working their first job or any job, then this becomes a default because a collapse of the economy 
that looks at not treating young workers or diverse, uh, you know, immigrants and others, people of color, BIPOC, you know, workers. If we're paying people below a living wage, it forces them to go to this economy. So, and I remember those conversations years ago when people said, we're building a new economy, it's called the sharing economy. No, this is a leftover economy. This is like, how are we perpetuating poverty? And it's the saddest thing that we have to try to find a way that we can make the gig economy work. And yes, there should be a, an opportunity for people who want to work part-time or want flexible hours, but still pay them a living wage. We still see these gig workers, they're not getting paid a living wage. They're still struggling and they're paying now what? I don't know what it is in Ottawa, but it's $2 a liter for gas here. And so they're losing money. So I think this is a good question, but it's really, I don't think it gets to what where the question should be, which is why are we forcing people into these working situations? Interesting, thank you, David. Andrea? You know, David was exactly on point. You know, precarious work for marginalized groups is a big issue. They're working, but they're working precarious jobs. They have multiple jobs and, you know, we saw during COVID that because they were out and having multiple jobs and on the front lines, that the infection rate in racialized community was really high. You know, it's not because we have a genetic predisposition, but because we had to be out there hustling all the time. I took an Uber yesterday and I had a woman, Ethiopian woman driver, and we chat and she said, Uber just, we saw the gas, as David mentioned, gas prices, Uber gave them 25 cents towards gas prices. That's ridiculous. They're not making any money. I talked to the Instacart people who deliver my, and, and I found out too, that also is, you know, I used to be so excited about that economy. I thought, oh, you know, people can schedule work when they want and all that, but that's not what it is. It's a further exploitation of, of mostly marginalized people, right? That, that is happening through these, these things. And that's why social procurements and local buying is so important. Wonderful, thank you for that. It, it, um, the comments that, you, that you've both made make me think about a conversation I had recently around uh, employment. And you know, a comment was made that is the, is the conversation about employment or do we need to be talking about income? You know, and it's kind of uh, that, that balance of it, uh, of it as well. So there's some, some interesting pieces, uh, pieces to this. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, and I noticed Janice in the chat has also mentioned, uh, thank you both for your insightful responses. So um, excellent, thank you for, for sharing that. And you know, we may dig into that a little bit in our, in our next webinar as we talk about uh, building a diverse workforce as part of, uh, as part of how we look at uh, community wealth building and ensuring that we are being inclusive and, uh, and looking at all pools of talent that exist in our community and how do we better do that, but also understand um, how we can help lift within those communities, but also how do we reach them, right? Looking back to a little bit of what Andrea said. So that will be our, our next webinar happening in April. So I imagine we may dig into that a little bit deeper there, which is great. Um, I, I am going to ask before we move to our, our next piece, um, we would love to get a screenshot uh, from the event today. Um, so I'll ask if you're open to it, my colleague Haley will take a, a photo of us. So if you if you don't mind, I'll, I'll if, open up your screen so we can see you open your video. Um, we would love to take a photo. So maybe Haley, if you want to give us a warning when you're going to do that or Nora, I'm not sure which one of you is, is going to do that. Uh, and we can be ready to go on there. Yeah, I'll give us a second. I see there's a couple more people coming on camera. Wonderful. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to count down from three, uh, two, uh, and if everyone wants to smile on one, then we'll take it when we're all ready. One. Perfect. And we're good. Great. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for, for indulging us with, uh, with that. It's a great way to promote the conversations we've been having and encourage more folks to join us at our, at our upcoming sessions as well. So um, 
I'm going to ask Renata if you can put up uh, the five keys to capacity building uh, that were mentioned by uh, by Andrea. That would be great because we'll use that to leverage in our next piece of the conversation as well. So I'll give that a moment to come up. On there, excellent. We also have them in the uh, in the chat as well. So again, the five keys to capacity building are uh, removing systemic and artificial barriers, building bid readiness and tender capacity, inclusive award criteria, and shorter payment periods. Um, you know, for act and uh, accountability for action reporting on metrics. So again, these these five ideas that Andrea shared amongst the wealth of knowledge that you've provided to us. So again, thank you for that, Andrea. But we're going to use this to dig into some some thinking pieces for the group that's here today. So we're now going to go into an activity uh, to gather some ideas from you and to do some sharing amongst amongst all the experience that we have in the session today. So we want to understand how can we as a community help bridge the gaps and build capacity based on the five key things that Andrea highlighted. So again, they're in the chat for you if you want to take a look there. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, we know that some of you are leaders by title in your organizations and some by action. So meaning that the ability to impact and influence may look a little bit different for each of us. We ask that you bring some practicality into the conversations we're going to go into, right? We know there's there's set limits, but also encourage some blue, blue sky thinking, right? So we want to be able to drive change and driving change means building processes, you know, that we can follow along, but also finding ways to challenge existing systems. Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to go into breakout rooms. So we're going to have four breakout rooms. Uh, those who are in rooms one and two. I want you to consider the question, so based on the five keys that Andrea mentioned, what is an action that your organization could take to support these? And so just throw out some ideas in, in your group. Uh, and then for rooms three and four, the question for you will be, what is an action that you could take individually to support these? And again, use that sense of practicality, but also a bit of that blue sky thinking of where, where you think things could go. And again, I want to challenge you that there's no right or wrong answers. We want to generate ideas that may spark change. So an idea may work well for one person and for another person, they say, oh, that's a non-starter for whatever reason, right? So e equipping us all in the way uh, that can help us drive, uh, drive change as we look ahead. So for each of the rooms, I, I ask that one of the participants uh, will maybe raise their hand to capture a few key ideas that you can share back with the large group when we come back. So probably looking for, you know, three to five things that really stood out in, in the group um, that can come back and share either verbally or by, by chat. Uh, so we're going to give you 10 minutes in the rooms. And I encourage you to turn on your cameras to interact with each other in the breakout room. So again, you'll want to turn off your cameras and unmute yourself. And you'll notice that we've put the details for, uh, for the activity in the chat as well. So again, Andrea's five keys are in there, as well as an outline of, of what your questions are. So again, those in room one and two, what is an action that your organization could take to support these? And question in room three and four, what is an action that you could take individually to support these? Um, so I think my colleague Noor will open, uh, open the breakout rooms. Before we, before we jump in, does anybody have any uh, questions, a technical question, anything that they need to get into there? Take a quick look and see. I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any questions. So uh, Noor, I think we're, we're good to go into our rooms. Wonderful, welcome back everybody. I love coming back from breakout rooms. You know, it's kind of fun. You see everybody popping back in and everybody usually has their video on, right? It's kind of a, a, a bit of a different experience. So uh, first and foremost, thank you so much for um, for participating and to engage in those conversations with your uh, with your counterparts in the breakout rooms. I know, uh, I know for some it's very comfortable and maybe you have confidence in the conversations and this isn't new to you. And for others, um, you may be new to this conversation or maybe, um, you know, aren't as, aren't as comfortable speaking in a room where you're not as familiar with all the folks. So thank you for maybe stepping out of your comfort zone there and doing that. Um, I look forward to hearing some of the ideas that, that came out in the room. So maybe what I'll do first is I will look to rooms one and two. Um, so if I could have a volunteer come in from room number one and share um, 
So again, the question was, what is an action your organization could take to support the five keys to capacity, build, capacity building? And what are some of the ideas that came out in your room? And again, there's no, there's no right or wrong answers, just ideas that we can share with the group. So we'd love to hear some of those. Shannon, I think I can share from group one some thoughts. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I just want to have the question in front of me. What is an action your organization can take? I think we also talked about how um, we as individuals can hold different organizations to account as well in, in both our own and others. Um, and we talked about uh, kind of three themes which have to do with questioning, shaming, and rewarding. Um, so we heard from some different organizations about how they had changed their practices um, based just on a question that was asked of them that they had never considered before. So, you know, how do you how are you doing work in this social value space or have you considered doing something this way, which might offer more social value in, in your community? So offering, um, you know, just asking those questions of, of yourselves as an organization and asking it of others if you don't have that uh, sphere of, of understanding yet. Um, the other, I mean, that was kind of along the lines of, of shaming in terms of like, well, if you if you kind of use your influence over others to encourage them um, to, to take better steps, then that's a way too. But also we talked about rewarding good behavior. So the, um, the power of promotion of someone who is an organization that is doing really good work, you know, through social media, through your networks, um, through sharing them, um, you know, as you start to do business in different areas of, of offering them as a really great example of that work. If you know that they are doing that social value um, work, then that's, you know, that's a really great way for, for them to build their capacity and for others to look to them for their business as well. Excellent. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing those highlights. Really appreciate that, Haley. And to everyone in group number one, thank you for bringing that. And I love kind of that interesting approach that you had to it, to those those levels of um, kind of the impact that the that those changes have and what you need to think about. So thank you for that. Uh, now I will look to group uh, room number two. Um, so again, that same question: What is an action your organization could take to support the five keys to capacity building? And I believe that's uh, Janelle is going to share those thoughts. Hi everyone. Um, some of the things we talked about were um, changing bylaws to allow sole sourcing uh, to social enterprises, um, implementing a dashboard of what that spending looks like so data can be pulled from it and communicated about internally. Um, also creating an internal communication strategy to support people to make that cultural shift um, so people know it's not just about uh, procuring the goods and services, it's about the broader uh, community impact. Um, uh, being mindful about uh, supporting uh, newcomer minority-owned businesses and suppliers, um, expanding to health insurance, um, who provides workshops, um, who is uh, creating the uh, photographs and who what graphic artists are being used. Um, a program to help uh, newcomers and entrepreneurs start their own businesses is another thing someone had added that they were doing. Um, I think if there's anything else that I've missed, uh, feel free to, to add to that group too. Thanks. Excellent. That's some great capturing. And again, I encourage if you have other thoughts that you that you didn't hear that you want to add in, feel free to pop them into the chat because that's a great space too where people can uh, can grab them from. Yeah. So we uh, yeah definitely heard a lot about you know what the businesses that you're using day to day. Are you ensuring that they uh, represent a variety of groups as well? So thank you for that, Janelle. I'll look to somebody from room number three now. And again, now we're gonna shift over into the individual side of things. And what is an action that you could take individually to support the five keys to capacity building? So who's gonna share from group number three? Hi, Shannon, this is Maham. Uh, I'm joining you from Bisocial Canada. I'm here with David. Um, and I think I just wanna start off by saying that the group acknowledged that it's somehow easier um, to do it on an organizational level than an individual level. Um, but we started off with talking about kind of like, how can we have a more inclusive award criteria? And some of the things that we spoke about was just kind of understanding, like who are those groups that kind of need, you know, that inclusivity or require that. And then not just like who they are, but then the next step would be, how can we like tangibly include them? Um, and one of the key pieces that we 
uh, kind of came up with was that actually engaging with community. So just kind of having that like kind of public engagement, talking to individuals um, and just understanding what those gaps and what those pieces are um, mm -hmm. to make those award criteria actually more inclusive. Um, another point that was raised was that it's, um, and especially within the construction sector, is that there is such an issue with regard to supply. So, and then taking it a step further, actually kind of having supply chains that are inclusive and buying from socially conscious companies uh, and social enterprises is even a bigger challenge because it makes that group like even tinier. Um, the other thing is that I think Ian mentioned this, we were lucky enough to have him in our group. Um, Ian said that during um, these last few years, he's actually found it easier to buy products from local companies um, just because um, those products are maybe more readily available. The shipping times are less. And then there's that notion of like having maybe a personal relationship with those um, businesses. Um, another thing was uh, kind of looking and identifying that sometimes when we're buying, it's very important to understand that sometimes it's okay to have substitutes. So we want a specific product, but we can't get it. And we acknowledge that, you know, maybe we can get it from a social enterprise or like a socially, um, a, a, an organization that like kind of focuses on social value. So being open to substitutes was something else that was really important. Another thing is, is that just with regards to kind of a payment, is to be open to kind of um, using cash or direct payments rather than using credit cards, which create a delay in the entire process. Um, and then another thing is that on an individual level, what are the everyday buying decisions that we can ourselves take as an individual consumer um, that you know kind of create community impact? And um, we were given the, the, the example of like, you know, do we have to really click on, for example, Amazon and just do something that we can get in like two days? I mean, even if there's a slight delay or, you know, um, what about looking at local options or companies or turning to like maybe our neighbors or other people within mm -hmm. our, you know, that we can actually turn to in order to kind of purchase those products. And this is an individual kind of buying decision that we can take on an ongoing basis. And we might think, it, you know, what kind of impact will that have? But the accumulation of all of those individual consumer choices actually do create a like real community impact. Wonderful, thank you for that, Mom. And I and that that concept that you mentioned at the end, um, I don't know, it l l makes me think about a journey I started a few years ago of, of reducing plastic in my house. And I promise you there's a linkage here. But one of the big things that when I was following, you know, different Instagram accounts or different things to figure out how to do that, it was that idea that, driving change in this isn't going to be about a few big orgs doing uh, a few things differently. It's actually about a bunch of people doing a few little things differently, right? And it makes me think about that that linkage uh, for, for myself, right? How do you drive that from those small choices? And then also thinking about when you mentioned the piece over the last two years, it made me think about my journey and all the local things that are sitting in my house and that I've been exposed to that uh, in the so-called before times, you know, I, we we didn't venture out as much to go and and try to find those things as actively. So um, I also appreciated that uh, that kind of shift that's happened maybe for, for others as well in the last couple of years. So thank you for that. Um, I'll look to now room number four, again, to, to give some more ideas around that same thought about what is an action that you could take individually to support the five keys to capacity building. I can. Um, so we, we didn't get quite as specific uh, as Maham and group number three, uh, but they got to benefit from the, the expertise of bi-social, so it's unfair. They had an unfair competitive advantage in this exercise. <laughs> But um, but our group we had a bit of a mix uh, mixed group um, like I, I'm from government and, uh, and then we had some community stakeholders involved as well that work more directly with um, you know disadvantaged and barrier populations and so our our the the key themes that we ended up hitting on was really about sort of acknowledging that we all have the different roles to play and have sort of different pieces of the puzzle um, at our disposal and so working with our respective colleagues. Um, and stakeholders to demystify the complex informations and systems and to share the knowledge that we do have, um, acknowledging that none of us really has all of it. Um, and so it was really about continuing to have conversations and, and building common understandings uh, through conversations like this and, and sort of bilateral conversations between government and stakeholders and between stakeholders and their stakeholders. So, um, you know, for example, Camilla uh, 
her organization works with youth and uh, youth and, and for her one of the biggest things was um, helping to break down sort of information and make it more accessible and digestible to those individuals um, that they support because it, it can be very complicated. So um, sort of reducing some of those knowledge and information barriers and, uh, and Henry brought up a similar point, but uh, more around sort of understanding how marginalized groups are engaged um, in the procurement processes um, and shedding more light for those who have a role to play in those processes to sort of highlight and, and work to reduce barriers. Um, but it was really about having conversations and, and continuing to sort of have the, the knowledge flow. Uh, and if anybody from my group wants, wants to add anything, uh, please feel free. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justin, and to, and to the rest of your groups. And I, and I, you know, and I appreciate that with between the four groups. Yeah, it sounded like each conversation was approached a little bit differently, maybe from a bit of a different angle and pulled out some different pieces. And I think, you know, the great benefit of that is that hopefully each of us has heard maybe one, two, three things uh, that stand out to us that we can both impact and influence organizationally um, and potentially also take personally. And there was a kind of a bit of a thread that I heard through a, a, a few of those pieces. You know, and I think back to, um, when Haley was first sharing from from group number one and talking about you know how how some of the change started with questions you know getting that that tough question to go and, uh, and Maha mentioned that sometimes it can be easier to do things organizationally um, you know but but it's individuals have ideas that they bring to the table and it takes an individual to ask that question of an organization right so it really is intertwined there and I think I know I felt I heard that through some of those answers that that we had there um so I do hope that you've got some ideas and I actually encourage you if, if you weren't already taking notes I know I have some on on my side um but to grab a close by pen or something and write down one or two things for yourself before uh before it leaves your brain and and you move on with the rest of your day right um that little mini any commitment that you can make to yourself as we as we have all these great ideas swirling around and again we're recording today's session so you're also welcome to come back and re-listen to these pieces um, to capture them as we move forward um, so again thank you so much for for sharing your thoughts and ideas and putting those pieces out there oh and i also see that janelle has just placed another uh, thought in the in the chat here so um, i'll ask the for the powerpoint to come back up and i'll, I'll share this as well uh, so janelle shared that other things that were shared in our group so this was group number two for, uh, thinking about the organizational we're creating an faq about social enterprises and case studies that illustrate the impact to further understand the benefits yeah and i think that links back to um, uh, Janelle, you'd also mentioned about the communications internally to help bring people on board, right? Uh, and that is so key as we think about these processes that we're trying to, again, impact and influence and change um, as, we, as we look forward. How do you pull those levers to drive change dependent on where people and organizations are at and drive that forward? So again, thank you so much for your participation in, in today's session. We, again, truly appreciate uh, we know many of you have continued on this conversation with us, and some of you were new to it today, and we hope that you do choose to continue forward. Um, again, our next webinar at the end of April will focus on inclusive and diverse workforce development um, and encourage you to, to look at attending that. So when we think about walking away from today, not only do you want to consider what are some of those key takeaways that, that you might have had from that last conversation, as well as our speakers, but we want you to think and consider applying the principles of community wealth building into your everyday operations. Again, whether that's organizationally or personally, you can still drive impact. Join our community wealth building champions table. So we're going to meet quarterly uh, really as a community of practice table to think about how do we as a community work together to drive these forward and also learn from each other on the journeys that we're each respectively on. You can visit our United Way East Ontario Building Community Wealth landing page to learn more and keep up to date on what is happening in our work. You can again check out the upcoming webinars in April and May. So there again, you'll learn more about attracting and retaining a diverse workforce as well as about community benefit agreements. You can learn more by visiting the Buy Social Canada website and refer to the CSED Social Enterprise Directory and the links where I've mentioned that there's links, those are in the chat for you as well. 
uh, connect with local resources and buy local when possible. I'll remind you at the start of the session today, we had ideas share a bunch of great uh, local, local businesses, services, opportunities that you can get out and try. And so again, I encourage you to save the chat from today's session. And again, you do that by going to the three little dots in the chat box and you can click save chat and that will download onto your, uh, onto your device. It'll only show the, uh, the public chat, not private chats that, that happen, just if you were curious. Um, and lastly, we ask that you complete our survey. So we will place the survey in the chat box for you if you want to complete it right now and take a moment to do that. Or we will also send it out in our post event email for you to take some time to do as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us here today and being part of the conversation. We really do appreciate your continued contributions and your willingness to, to learn and try new things as we move forward as a community. So have a wonderful afternoon and we look forward to seeing you again.